If you are new, my name is Braden. I'm the pastor here at Mission Gathering. And something that really sets Mission Gathering apart um, from other churches, and really what is specific to many progressive churches, is that progressive churches like Mission Gathering, sermons are meant to start discussions, not end them. The goal is not for us to all think and act the exact same. The goal is for us to think critically about what we believe and through the process become more Christ-like people. And so we've been starting, we just started a few weeks ago with going verse by verse through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this whole series is called Jesus' Upside Down Kingdom because this is what throughout history many theologians and Christians have referred to this idea of the kingdom of God as that Jesus preached what was called the kingdom of God, and it's so countercultural. It's so opposed and different from the values of the world, the different kingdoms of this world, that essentially it's very much upside down to the values that we are used to and are immersed in. And so it's very much upside down from all of that. And so today we are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, where Jesus talks about this idea of salt and light. He says that you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And most of us, we know what it means to be light. This is, a, this is a phrase that we commonly use to be enlightened, to shed some light on. You know, you have a light bulb moment when you have an idea. It's this idea of something good and really just having this perspective that is different and bringing you know, light into darkness. It's something we're very familiar with. But we don't totally know what it means to be salt. That's not really something that we use. In fact, in many generations, it's actually used to mean quite the opposite of what Jesus is getting at. Like, salty is something that millennials, Gen Z, use to kind of, just, if someone's resentful, if they're bitter, if they're irritated about something, that's something we typically talk about, of being salty. And that's naturally not what Jesus is referring to here. So when Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, he's not talking about being salty, he's actually talking about something good. And so salt in the first century, in Jesus' context, we can have to set aside the perspectives that we have, of what that could potentially mean, and really look at the ancient context that Jesus existed in. Some of it we're pretty familiar with, you know, condiment for improving the taste of food. That's something that most of us are very familiar with. That was one of the purposes. Really, scholars have identified about 11 different ways in which people thought about salt in the ancient world, but we'll focus on three for today. <laughs> and the second was really a preservative. So, you know, pre-refrigeration and all of that. It was something where you would put salt on food, on meat, to prevent it from decaying, to try to have it stay fresh for just maybe a little bit longer than otherwise. And the third way was it was used to clean wounds. And Jesus' primary point in all of this is that we are to make the world a better place. And Jesus, he does not say that, hey, you can be salt and light. You, if you just live a certain way, but he simply just says that you are salt and light, which I think is very, very important to recognize, as maybe cliche as it sounds, it's this idea that you are already making the world a better place. Is my mic not working? No, you're good. Okay, okay, awesome. So this is kind of important to recognize that where we are, are currently, just by existing, just by doing what we're doing, you are making the world a better place. And so when we look at this idea of what salt is in the first century, this is, there's kind of three things that I want to focus on and draw out of here for our own lives. This idea of improving, preventing, and cleaning. And so I'm just going to kind of go through this one by one. And when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, like I said, salt was something that improved the taste of good food. And so in a very similar way, we are called to improve what is already good on earth, what is already good in the world. And so there are many things that if you look around just church, like Mission Gathering or our larger community, La Mesa, San Diego, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good things. And oftentimes when we talk about doing good in the world, while there are oftentimes many new things that we can begin, there are times in which maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are already wonderfully amazing things going on in our community that we can participate in. And so one of the things that we can think about with this passage is how can you contribute to good things that are already happening in your community? 
We just talked about Los Angelitos with Corazon de Vida, this, the fact that we participate in contributing to this orphanage that Mexico does not really have social welfare systems like foster care. It's really all based within these private organizations. And so we partnered with one of these orphanages to really seek to make a difference. And this is something good that is already happening. This orphanage already existed. And Mission Gathering has been contributing and participating in this for quite a while now. And so maybe if you're thinking about what is something good that I can do, if there's something that is already existing like this. And there's also MG Kids. There's a reality that for many of us, we are here because we grew up in kind of a toxic version of Christianity that preached hate, that maybe just preached some form of condemnation that really internalized, and many of us are unlearning that. And so it's a beautiful thing to be able to create an environment for kids where they don't have to experience that, where they get to experience a different kind of Christianity, one that is based on race, on love, that encourages values of curiosity, inclusivity, and justice. And so that's perhaps something that could be something that you would want to participate in. And like I said, there's so many others. Within mission gathering, you participate in worship, you participate in our care ministries. But then even beyond mission gathering, as I said, there's so many amazing things that are going on throughout La Mesa and throughout San Diego. And so to think about when it comes to being salt of the earth, of what are good things that are already happening that we can participate in. And then secondly, salt was this idea of slowing down decay. And particularly in that context, but I think it can be interpreted this idea of preventing the decay of the earth, that we are the salt of the earth, we are helping prevent the decay. And I put a little note there on all these that, hey, this is my interpretation. As I said, you don't have to agree with everything that I say. This is really the idea of thinking critically about this and seeking to become more loving people. And so this is something that there are many ways to interpret this. Oftentimes in Christian circles, we look at this idea of moral decay. And unfortunately, in different spectrums of Christianity, we view that differently in terms of what moral decay means. But in more progressive circles, we think of the massive amounts of prejudice, of exclusion that still exists in the world today. And how oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, but if someone learns that I'm a Christian, particularly if they learn that I'm a Christian pastor, they have certain ideas about what I believe about the world and about people. And so when people ask, oh, are you a Christian? I end up kind of having this visceral reaction of like, yes, but I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm not homophobic. I'm not transphobic. And the, the fact of the matter is that is unfortunately what many people think of when they think of Christianity. And so when we talk about this of how can, of being salt of the earth to help prevent moral decay, of we are called to really resist this reality of how we can contribute to dispelling and dismantling various prejudices that exist. And as I said, oftentimes in the West, in the United States, some of this hate is then fueled by various Christian narratives. And so we get to help participate in kind of redeeming the narrative of Christ and helping to push a different narrative that is more loving, that is more inclusive. And through that, I think that we are helping to prevent this moral decay of various prejudices and nationalism. But then there's also this idea of physical decay. This is something that a lot of Christians are kind of resistant to this idea of climate change and the various ways in which the world is decaying and the world is being affected by human action. But when you look at this, it really, there's this idea within scripture of creation care. From the get-go, when Adam and Eve are created as these kind of figures that are representative of all of humanity, the call that they're given, the first command that they're given, is to care for the earth. And unfortunately, that has been interpreted in such a way that means we can kind of do whatever we want to the earth. There's kind of this language of, you know, having dominion over the earth that some Christians use. But the primary language there is to be caretakers of the earth. That creation care, environmental protection, was one of the original commandments, one of the initial calls for people who call themselves followers of God or followers of Jesus. And so when we talk about being salt of the earth, helping prevent decay, the earth is literally 
being impacted. It is literally being degraded. And so how are ways in which we can participate in this? And as I've talked about before, we are part of a larger denomination called the Disciples of Christ. And so one of the ways in which we resist moral decay is by being an LGBTQ inclusive church, an anti-racist church. But in addition, there's this um, branch of the Disciples of Christ called Green Chalice. And really, it's this major educational program that really comes alongside churches who want to become more environmentally conscious. And so if there's something, if this is something that you are passionate about, I encourage you to, to talk to me about this because something that Green Chalice has, they have these programs, they have these uh, tools, these resources. And the first step is this idea of forming what, is, what they call a green team people who are passionate about environmental consciousness within church contexts. And so that as an organization, we can start to become more eco-friendly. And then you can kind of form a committee and start taking these steps. And so to have a team of people who are passionate about this, who can start working toward these steps together. So like I said, environmental decay, physical decay of the earth is another way in which we can participate in resisting this idea of being the salt of the earth. And then lastly, salt cleans or purifies wounds. This was a common practice in the ancient world. And so in thinking of how this relates to our current context of bringing healing to the world. And that phrase can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. If you came from a Pentecostal background, you might have a bit of a visceral reaction to that. I'm not talking about healing ministries or fake healings or anything like that. But what I am talking about is kind of this idea of bringing healing to the wounded in a metaphorical way, in which many people have been radically hurt by the church, by larger culture. And so many of us walk around with different internal wounds. So this is a way in which we can participate simply by being a light in the world, simply by being the faith community that we are. But then there's also the literal nature of that, that some of you actually in your work, in your what you do in your daily life, is bringing literal healing to the wounded. If you were a doctor, if you were in healthcare, including mental health care, there is ways in which we can participate in this healing in many ways. And ultimately, Jesus goes on to talk about this idea of being light, which, like I said, that's something that we are very familiar with, that analogy of being a light in the darkness. And he encourages us, no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so Jesus talks about the ways in which we can be light in the world. And he specifically says that by doing this, we will give glory to our Father in heaven. And so I think from Jesus' perspective, acts of goodness, that's what compels people the most. In fact, he has this command that he repeats that by by loving one another, the world will know that we are his disciples. So from Jesus' perspective, it's not about evangelizing. It's not about trying to just preach to others and compel them through just, you know, for the sake of argument, but rather by how we live. And we know this to be true by seeing how many people, including maybe some of us in this room, have been turned off by religion, have been turned off by Christ and Christianity, by how religious people have acted. And so the reverse is true, that if we live in a loving, radically compelling way, that that is more compelling than any argument of simply seeing the beauty of a community, simply seeing the beauty of how someone lives their life and saying, hey, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to experience some of that in my life because we are naturally drawn to light in the midst of darkness. And so that is, that is really what Jesus is getting at in this text here, in the Sermon on the Mount. This, this call to be salt and light is this invitation to do good deeds in the world. And I just want to clarify, because depending on what context you grew up in, there's sometimes this aversion to that language of good deeds because we see it as having to do with salvation. That, oh, if someone does good deeds, then they're loved and accepted by God. 
And I just want to emphasize that that's not what we're at all about here. That's really, I identify very much as a Christian universalist, meaning that every single person is loved and accepted and welcomed into God's kingdom, regardless of how they live, regardless of their beliefs. And this is something that has been a common thread throughout the history of Christianity. Many Christians from the very get-go have believed in this idea. And in fact, when you look at Jesus' teachings, this entire Sermon on the Mount, he does not talk about heaven and hell. There are passages in which we sometimes interpret it to mean that, but that's not Jesus' whole approach here. This whole thing about living in the kingdom of God is about just living within this ethical trajectory of what Jesus invites us to do. And so we're going to transition to communion at this time. And I think this is just something that we come back to time and time again here at Mission Gathering. Because Jesus talked about this idea of every single time we gather to do this in remembrance of him. And Jesus, he lived this life with his disciples for, for years where he taught them about his kingdom. He taught them about how they are to live their lives. And so as we do this, we are remembering what Jesus taught. This radical compassion, this radical love. And this image of the bread, he talks about as being his body. And the image of the juice or the wine, he talks about being his blood or the new covenant. The new covenant was this idea in the book of Isaiah of the law being written on our hearts, of the laws not just being rules written on a page that we try to do, but rather something that becomes internalized, that becomes a part of who we are. And then Paul, the apostle, brings this analogy further by talking about the body being the body of Christ, that all of us collectively embody this. And so as we come to the table, it is this reminder that every single person is a part of God's kingdom, that every single person is welcome to the table of grace, that Jesus gathered around all of his disciples, even the ones he knew that were going to betray him or deny him. And so in the same way, we participate, we all come to the table, regardless of background, regardless of belief, regardless of how we live, we are all part of the one community, the one table. And that we remind ourselves to live this life of love, this life of radical inclusion and compassion each time we come to the table. So let me pray, and then we'll spend communion together. God, I thank you so much for this radical grace, this radical inclusion, this radical love that Jesus embodied and taught. And God, I pray that as we just spend communion together, that we would be reminded of the life and teachings of Jesus and that we would feel compelled to be the body of Christ in the world, to be salt and light, to be a community and to be people that dispel and dismantle narratives of prejudice, that seek to participate in redeeming and purifying the world and participating in restoration. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.